our function. What's happening, as far as I'm concerned, in the universities in particular, and spreading very rapidly out into the broader world, including the corporate world, much to, its, uh, much to what should be its chagrin, is a collectivist narrative. And of course, there's some act utility in a collectivist narrative, because we're all part of groups in different ways. But the collectivist narrative that I regard as politically correct is a pastiche of, a strange pastiche of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. And its fundamental claim is that, no, you're not essentially an individual. You're essentially a member of a group. And that group might be your ethnicity, and it might be your sex, and it might be your race, and it might be any of the endless numbers of other potential groups that you belong to, because you belong to many of them. And that you should be essentially categorized along with those who are like you on that dimension in that group. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that the proper way to view the world is as a battleground between groups of different power. So you define the groups first, and then you assume that you, you, you view the individual from the group context, you view the battle between groups from the group context, and you view history itself as a consequence of nothing but the power maneuvers between different groups. That eliminates any consideration of the individual in, at a very fundamental level. And also, any idea, for example, of free speech, because if you're collectivist at heart in this manner, there is no such thing as free speech. It isn't that it's debated by those on the radical left and, and, the, and let's say the rest of us, so to speak. It's that in that formulation, there's no such thing as free speech because for an individualist, free speech is how you make sense of the world and reorganize society in a proper manner. But for the radical left type collectivist that's associated with this viewpoint of political correctness, when you speak, all you're doing is playing a power game on behalf of your group. And there's nothing else that you can do because that's all there is. And not only is that all there is in terms of who you are as an individual now and how society should be viewed, it's also the fundamental narrative of history. For, for example, it's, it's widely assumed in our universities now that the best way to conceptualize Western civilization is as an oppressive, male-dominated patriarchy, and that the best way to construe relationships between men and women across the centuries is one of oppression of women by men. And it's like, well, look, no hierarchy is without its tyranny. That's, a, that's an axiomatic truth. People have recognized that literally for thousands of years. And hierarchies do tend towards tyranny, and they tend towards the usurpation by people with power. But that only happens when they become corrupt. We have mechanisms in our society to stop hierarchies from becoming intolerably corrupt, and they actually work pretty well. And so, and so I, I, would also, I, would also, I would also point this out. You know, don't be thinking that this is a debate about whether empathy is useful or not, or that the people on the con side of the argument are not empathetic. I know perfectly well, as I'm, as I'm sure Mr. Fry does, that hierarchies tend to produce situations where people stack up at the bottom, and that the dispossessed in hierarchies need a political voice, which is the proper voice of the left, by the way, and the necessary voice of the left. But that is not the same as proclaiming that the right level of analysis for our grand unifying narrative is that all of us are fundamentally to be identified by the groups that we belong to and to construe the entire world as the battleground between different forms of tyranny in consequence of that group affiliation. And to the degree that we play out that narrative, that won't be progress, believe me. And we certainly haven't seen that progress in the universities. We've seen situations like what happened at Wilfrid Laurier University instead. We won't see progress. What we'll return to is exactly the same kind of tribalism that characterized the left. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson, your six minutes starts now. Thank you very kindly. Wonderful opportunity to be here in Canada. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to stand here at the podium. I'm a preacher. <laughs> and I will ask for an offering at the end of my presentation. <laughs> this is the swimsuit competition of the intellectual beauty pageant. <laughs> so let me show you the curves of my thought. <laughs> oh my God, was that a politically incorrect statement I just made? How did we get to the point where the hijacking of the discourse on political correctness has become a kind of mannequin distinction between us and them? The abortive fantasy just presented 
is remarkable for both its clarity and yet the muddiness of the context from which it has emerged. What's interesting to me is that when we look at the radical left, I'm saying, where they at? I want to join them. <laughs> they ain't running nothing. I'm from a country where a man stands up every day to tweet the moral mendacity of his viciousness into a nation he has turned into his psychic commode. Y'all got Justin, we got Donald. <laughs> so what's interesting then is that political correctness has transmogrified into a caricature of the left. The left came up with the term political correctness, shall I remind you. We were tired of our excuses and our excesses and our exaggerations. We were willing to be self-critical in a way that I fear my confrères, my compatriots, are not. Don't take yourself too seriously, smile. Take yourself not seriously at all, but what you do with deadly seriousness. Now it is transmogrified into an attempt to characterize the radical left. The radical left is a metaphor, it's a symbol, it's an articulation. They don't exist, their numbers are too small. I'm on college campuses, I don't see much of them coming. When I hear about identity politics, it amazes me. The collectivist identity politics, uh, last time I checked, white folk invented race. That was an invention from a dominant culture that wanted groups to, at their behest. The invention of race was driven by the demand of a dominant culture to subordinate others. Patri right? Patriarchy. Patriarchy was the demand of men to have their exclusive vision presented. The beauty of feminism is it's not going to resolve differences between men and women. It just says men don't automatically get the last word. Of course, in my career, they never did. <laughs> and so identity politics has been generated as a bete noir of the right, and yet the right doesn't understand the degree to which identity has been foisted upon black people and brown people and people of color from the very beginning on women and trans people. You think that I want to be part of a group that is constantly abhorred by people at Starbucks? <laughs> I'm minding my own black business. <laughs> Walking down the street, I have group identity thrust upon me. They don't say, ah, ha, ha, there goes a Negro. Highly intelligent, articulate, verbose, <laughs> capable of rhetorical fury at the drop of a hat. We should not interrogate him as to the bona fides of his legal status. No, they treat me as part of a group. And the problem is that our friends don't want to acknowledge is that the hegemony, the dominance of that group has been so vicious that it has denied us the opportunity to exist as individuals. Individualism is the characteristic moment in modernity. Mr. Peterson is right. The development of the individual, however, is predicated upon notions of intelligence. Immanuel Kant and David Hume and others, philosophically, Descartes comes along, introducing knowledge into the, to the, to the, to the phrase, saying that knowledge is based upon a kind of reference to the golden intelligence, the reflective glass that one possesses, and yet it got rooted in the very ground of our existence. So knowledge has fleshly basis, and what I'm saying to you, the knowledge that I bring as a person of color makes a difference in my body because I know what people think of me, and I know how they respond to me, and that ain't no theory. Am I, am I mad at trigger warnings? The only trigger warning I want is from a cop. Are you about to shoot me? Not funny. In America, where young black people die repeatedly, unarmed, without provocation. And so for me, identity politics is something very serious. And what's interesting about safe spaces, I hear about the university I teach there. Look, if you're in a safe space in your body, you don't need a safe space. Some of that is overblown. Some of it is ridiculous, I understand. I believe that the classroom is a robust place for serious learning. I believe in the interrogation of knowledge based upon our understanding mutually of the edifying proposition of enlightenment. At the same time, some people ain't as equal as others. So we have to understand the conditions under which they have emerged and in which they have been benighted and attacked by their own culture. And I ain't seen nobody be a bigger snowflake than white men who complain. Mommy, mommy, they won't let us play and have everything we used to have under the old regime where we were right, racist and supremacists and dominant and patriarchs and hated gays and lesbians and transsexuals that, yeah, you got to share. This ain't your world, this is everybody's world. And let me end by saying this. You remember that story from David Foster Wallace 
fish are going down, two fish are going, and an older fish comes in the opposite direction. He said, hello, boys, how's the water? They swim on, they turn to each other, what the hell is water? Because when you're in it, you don't know it. When you're dominant, you don't know it. Nothing, Kaiser Sozi said, is more interesting that the devil did than to make people believe he didn't exist. That's what white supremacy is.